All right, well, let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. Ashley will catch up with us. We'll pray for her too. So. Father, we thank you for just, a, again, another time where we can come together. We can study your word. We can study these letters. I thank you for, um, again, the, just the way you preserve these for us so that we can study them. We can understand more of you and your character uh, and this beautiful man who uh, just loved to share your message all over the world and gave his life for it. Uh, again, I thank you also for uh, the man Titus just his character and uh, just his relationship with Paul and just how special of a relationship that was. So Father, help me to teach you well tonight. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's talk Titus. Titus was not a, a city, in case you were wondering. <laughs> some, know, have, some people don't even know that. All right. It's, it's called the Pastorals. Uh, we get Timothy and Titus. These are pastoral letters. It's written to this guy named Titus who I picture as a tatted up, earring, wears a lot of leather, likes to ride his Harley around. I, that's just the way I, I want to picture Titus, because um, I, I think he's just a tough guy. Let me explain why. Uh, we know Paul on his first missionary journey kind of scoots around that northern, uh, so, well, that southern Turkey area, comes back. He goes, he gets home. And as soon as he gets home from that, that first missionary journey, we get this controversy of, hey, these guys are coming up behind him. The Judaizers are coming behind Paul and saying, no, 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 I know you, you accepted Jesus and that's all good, but you need to have this little minor surgical procedure, guys. And the guys, I'm sure, at 40 years old are going, nah, I might get out on that one, all right? That, that may knock me out. And you can't eat these foods and you can't do this and you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this. And Paul says, uh -uh, why are you guys doing this? This is, not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Let's sit down and have a meeting. All right? So they all meet up where? Mary, remember, this is Acts 15. Everybody meets up and they come to Jerusalem. All right, we call this the Jerusalem Council. This is Acts 15. All of you should know about this council. All right? The main reason is because at this council, they decided the Jewish law don't need to follow the Jewish law anymore because Jesus filled it up, all right? He, he completed it, everything. He checked all the boxes. Everything's done. And so that's why a lot of people go, well, y'all don't eat shrimp anymore. Or you eat shrimp and that's not in the law. And go, well, funny you should mention that because in Acts 15, the church came together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and we determined that the old covenant was certainly replaced by Christ. So now we're no longer under that any longer. And they go, well, that means everything's okay now. We can do all this. Well, they had a couple of stipulations, and one of them was sexual immorality is still on the table because it wasn't a covenant thing. It was a design thing, all right? And the, nothing changed in the design of humanity, so nothing's going to change about that. So that's one of the laws they left on the table, okay? Now, here's what we have at this, though. We have this guy named Titus who evidently met up with Paul somewhere in and around the first missionary journey. And Paul says, hey, Titus, you want to come with us? And Titus goes, sure, I'll come. He is a Greek, all right, which means he was not circumcised. And he's at this meeting, and he's hearing all this stuff. And I love it because Luke portrays it, and he says, or excuse me, Paul's told it in the, in the Galatian letter. He said, you know, Titus came with me, and he's a Greek, and he wasn't persuaded at all. So what kind of strength does it take, strength of character does it take to go into a room? You're basically the only Gentile, maybe. He goes into the room and he's sitting there going, nah, I ain't going to be, I'm going to be circumcised. Everybody else is, but I'm good. What type of character, what type of character traits could stand up to that type of, that type of, I don't want to say temptation, but that peer pressure or that expectation? Because when we take off on the second missionary journey, um, first thing they do is they pick up Timothy along the way, all right? And Timothy feels the need to be circumcised. And so we get this kind of thing. Titus just kind of goes, hmm, no, nah, not going to happen. So that's why I, I like to picture him with the, the tattoos and all the, the Harley and everything. Second reason this, we go on the third missionary journey, and Paul is in Ephesus. Paul's there in Ephesus for three years. And he writes a letter to the Corinthian church. And he looks around and he goes, who's just big and bad enough to send this letter over to this city of Corinth, which is just sort of a little, a little rough, 
all right, it's a port city. You gonna send Timothy with this letter? Nah, nah. You're not gonna send Timothy with it. it you're definitely not gonna send John Mark with it. All right, John Mark got, he bailed on us on the first round. So who can we send? Titus. Gotta send Titus. So he goes, he sends Titus, and the plan was, Paul was gonna go, uh, he's Ephesus here, Troas is up here to the north, Corinth is on the other side of the Aegean Sea, and so they're going to send him over to Corinth with the letter, hey, we'll meet back up in, in Troas, all right? We'll meet in Troas, and, and we'll go from there. Well, when Paul leaves Ephesus and goes to Troas, there's no Titus. And Paul says, I had no rest in my spirit because we could not find Titus. Now, Paul is a pretty strong character. Who would be strong enough to cause Paul to have that kind of hesitation or that kind of I had no rest in my spirit because Titus isn't with me. I miss Titus. I, I'm devastated by this. And this is really the whole impetus of 2 Corinthians was ministry is just really hard. And, and, and I sent Titus over there and now Titus isn't here. And so he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church talking about how difficult it can be. And Titus not being there with him was main, one of the main causes, if not the main cause, of that second letter to the Corinthians. Well, eventually, Paul goes on to Macedonia, probably Philippi, and he's hanging out there, and guess who comes around the corner? Titus. Titus is finally here, all right? And, and it's a relief to him. It's a relief to him to do this. Now, further evidence of, of Titus' character in my book is Titus is left at, at Crete, all right? Now, what do we know about people from Crete? Are they wonderful people? Glory, no, no. Cretans, their own, their own prophets say they are liars and gluttons and just horrible people. All right? So, again, who do you send? Do you send John Mark? Do you send Timothy? When Timothy has to be reminded, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Okay, I can do this. I can do this, Paul. Is that who you're going to send? <clears throat> no. No. You got to send Titus, the one who goes to the Jerusalem Council and goes, well, I ain't getting circumcised. You all are crazy. I ain't doing that. All right. You, somebody else can do that. And I'm going to have me a, a nice pork sandwich over here later on in the day. All right. Put a little shrimp on top of that while you're at it. All right. That's who you want to send. So he sends him there to Crete. And that's the letter we're going to look at tonight. He talks about this. But even after this, in, the, in 2 Timothy, which we'll study next week for our last session, by the way, next week is our last session. Um, in 2 Timothy, Paul writes to uh, Timothy and says, he kind of gives a, a litany of everybody's here, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. Come to me as quickly as you can. He says that Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Right? Now, Dalmatia is essentially um, Croatia, old, the former Yugoslavia. All right, most of us are old enough where we, we go, oh, Yugoslavia, I got that. But the Croatia area right on the coast, pretty rough area. All right. This was not an area that the Romans controlled very well. Constant rebellion. constant. It's just who they were in their nature. They didn't like being controlled. And they could run back into, uh, I think it's the Caucasus, Mount, Caucasus Mountains, Caucasus Mountains, something like that. Um, and they could go back in there and hide, and they would come back. So they were very rebellious people. The Romans are constantly having to do this. So again, who do you send to that type of region? You send Titus. So that's how I've kind of formed this picture of who Titus is and just his character. And that's why I, he's one of my favorites. Because Timothy's just too easy. He's just, I just picked this nice little guy that went to seminary and, you know, wear, wears nice clothes and tucks in his shirt all the time and wears penny loafers with a penny in it. All right, just a straight lace guy. Titus, he's wearing leather. He's got leather on somewhere. I don't know where, but he's got leather on somewhere. So, all right, is that enough of, of a biographical sketch of him? All right. Now, time frame, this is, again, we have the three missionary journeys. Then we have Paul being arrested. Paul goes to Rome. Acts 28 ends with Paul was in Rome for two years preaching to anyone who came to the house, all this stuff. Evidently, from what we gather, <clears throat> he was on trial, put on trial. They said, no, we don't find anything here. There's nothing to charge you with. So they let him go. And he leaves. First, Timothy, remember, we talked about. I've gone to Macedonia or Philippi. Remember, that's sort of his go back to. That's his home. That's where he, he feels most comfortable. And he writes to Timothy in Ephesus. Well, now 
he's moved on to the city called Nicopolis, okay? Um, and Nicopolis is kind of on the opposite side of, um, of Greece from Athens. So Athens sits on that what, eastern shore. Nicopolis is on the western shore, all right? Just south of Yugoslavia, kind of where the boot of Italy points to it right there. So on the, on the not as advanced, culturally advanced side. That's where he is, Nicopolis. So it literally means the victory city. All right, so you can do that, whatever you want. So if you're wearing Nikes like me, Nico means victory, conquer, all that stuff. So, all right, we ready? Let's get after it. <clears throat> Titus, Titus 1. How do we start off? We see anything familiar here? We get author, we get audience, and we get what? Grace and peace. Grace and peace every time. Now, here's a trick on this one. The pastoral letters generally doesn't have that prayer right at the beginning. It doesn't have that, I, I thank God for all my remembrances of all of you. It's more of a personal letter, more of getting the, down to business. So when Paul writes to Timothy, he's got to take more of a fatherly tone to this, right? Because he's writing to Timothy. He, he's a guy who's learning the ropes. He's, he's sort of the mentor protege. With Titus, what does he need to do? He's been with him probably now, I would say we're pushing 15 years now. He sent Titus all over the place. Titus is good to go on his own. Paul doesn't feel like he needs to baby him. In fact, Paul is more upset when he's not around him than Titus is upset to, to not be around Paul. So the tone of this is going to be very different. It's not going to be this, you know, I don't want to say babying, but mentoring type of thing. Just cut him loose and let him run. The prayer, I like it. I think it comes here in one one. Paul he describes himself as a slave of God. Notice he doesn't call himself a prisoner any longer because he's not where? He's not in prison, all right? He calls himself a slave, which he's done with the Philippians letter and the Romans letter, all right? Um, and he calls himself an apostle, all right? It, which literally means a sent one. It's the Greek version of the word, of the Latin word missionary, okay? So Latin is missionary, Greek is apostle. So don't, don't get too weird about those. When you hear apostle, just think missionary. It literally means to be sent away. Apo is away. Stello means to be sent. Okay? So, just that simple. All right? And it's there, right there. It says, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he's revealed his message in the proclamation that I was entrusted with by the command of God, our Savior. Now, that's a quick title of himself, <laughs> all right? See, all of you need something like this and put it on a business card, about a paragraph-long thing of I am me, and I am a, an apostle and a slave of Christ who's doing this and doing this. this. So he, he, he kind of puts that in there. Now, does Titus need this? Does Titus need to, oh, oh, oh that Paul is writing me. No, he doesn't. But Paul, again, he's not writing this just for Titus. If it was, we probably would not have it today. He was writing this to Titus, but it would be a letter that he would have encouraged or he would have implied or he would have said, y'all preserve this. Preserve these letters, pass these letters around, and somebody would have come along and said, we're going to collect this. Because when Paul is just writing a note to Titus, he doesn't need to put all this, but because Paul is writing for a higher purpose, this is why he does this. Uh, to time, Titus, my true son in our common faith. Timothy also gets that label. Okay. Um, why, why does he use that term son? It's not a hard question. What, what, what's the relationship there? Okay, mentor, mentor. Uh, I think even in the faith, he sees himself as one who led Titus to Christ, and so therefore he kind of adopted him as his son. Now you're my son because I, I, I kind of fathered you into the faith. I led you into the faith. I was the one who brought you in. And now you are in the faith also. So Timothy's more of a mentor protege, uh, but Titus definitely has this label on him as well. All right, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus, our Savior. <clears throat> what does he normally say? Christ Jesus, our, our Lord. Okay, again, so when you read Luke, when you read Paul, anytime you see the word Lord, what should you always think? Who is he talking to? He's talking about Jesus. Lord is always Jesus in Luke and in Paul's writings, okay? 
So just lock that in whenever you see that. Um, they always refer to him, God the Father, Jesus is Lord. Okay, Except for this time he's, he throws Savior in there, which is kind of cool. All right, uh, what are we, verse 5? The reason I left you in Crete, um, and Crete is just south of Italy. All right? It's an island, just sits right there in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean. All right. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right, uh, which is kind of a medical term. Um, orthodontist, we get a word, it's, the word orthos is in here. Um, it would be a medical term where generally it would be more of setting a, a bone. Orthopedic, all right, literally means straight foot. So you're straightening out. So I want you to set right that which was left undone. And as I directed you, to appoint elders, uh, which is the word presbyters, which we get the Presbyterian church from this, to appoint elders in every town. And he, he's going to give a character sketch of what these gonna, guys are gonna, should be like. One who is blameless, the husband of one wife. Again, it's just at three words, one wife, man, all right? So we, don't, we can't read too much into that. Having faithful children not accused of wildness or rebellion, which does what for most of us? <laughs> Dang, never going to be one of those guys, all right? We're going to have to lower the bar. It's always funny to me that we lower the bars in some areas and we, we kind of raise the bars in others, all right? They have wild children? Uh, we all have wild children. <laughs> He's the best we got, okay? <clears throat> For an overseer, an episkopos, literally mean on to look, scope, episkopos, to look upon or to oversee the people, all right? This is the role of the elder, to oversee the people as God's administrator, all right? Now, he's just added three terms here. We've got elder, we've got overseer, and we've got administrator. These are all the same title, essentially. It's all playing the same role. The elder would literally mean one who is older, presbyter. Episcopos, the episcopos, all right, would be the overseer. And then you get this word administrator, which comes from two words. It's oikos, which is house, and nomos, which is law. The one who lays down the law in the house. Okay, this is the one who is the foreman. Is the um, I don't know. In the slave days, you would have the head slave, and he would be the foreman, and he would administer, and he would tell everybody what to do. This is this word here. It literally means the one who lays down the law in the house. All right. So for an overseer, as God's administrator must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable. Love that word, right? Philozinian, chase down strangers to love on them, all right? Philo uh, hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding fast to the message as taught, so that, all right, now we just saw his character sketch. This is got who... Titus has to go around all these cities in Crete and go, okay, I've got to find one of these guys that meets all of these things. But not only that, but he's also got to be one so that he will be able both to encourage and or encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. So what's the role of an elder in a church? We see a couple of words here. The first thing we want to see is overseer, one who oversees the church body. All right, not the church building, all right, amen, because we don't, we ain't got church buildings back then. They oversee the church, which means not the building, but the people in the church, okay? <clears throat> and then also holding fast to the message so they're both able to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. So the elders should be responsible for what role in the church? To teach. Is that not a pastor as well? A pastor would be included within this. Uh, they, they, would, they would have included pastor in this. Actually, we don't ever have the word pastor in, in any of Paul's letters. Right. So this would be the position. One of them would have been a pastor. Um, if y'all remember, he talked, I think it was last week in First Timothy, that the elders should be paying attention to teaching and preaching. And so that's where pastors would have kind of rolled in. We, we didn't really have this one official role of one pastor of each little church. We had a group of elders that would take the place of those teachers. So it's a different model that we have now than they had back then. Is that similar to what you think because of the way they came out of the Jewish faith? Because they had multiple men that were heads of the synagogue? I, 
Honestly, I, I would look at more of the bivocational model of churches today, that I would see those as more reflective of what the early churches were like that Paul was planting, that these men were bivocational. And, and so you would have several elders who fit those characteristics and have, were capable of doing these things, and they would play the role as, today I'm going to speak. Today I'm going to teach. Paul writes in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, um, or second. Don't hold me to this. Where he says, choose the better gift of prophecy, of speaking. And somebody, everybody take turns. There should be order in the church. So one person speaks, and then another person listens, and you, then another person will speak. And so it wasn't the model we have today of professional pastor type who leads the church. It was, it was sort of diversified a little more because we just didn't have that model. So, so that's what he's saying. When you go into, make sure each church, each city, and, and you would have one church essentially for each city, just make sure you have good elders. Make sure they have these characteristics and make sure they have these abilities, all right? And a lot of times, uh, the ability to do things like encouraging with sound teaching and refuting those who contradict it, a lot of times that's a gifting thing, all right? Uh, there's a lot of wonderful, beautiful, amazing Christian people who could not speak to save their life in front of an audience. Well, we, we had a church, a guy that was gonna do a church plant at a church we were at a couple of churches ago. And he was ready to launch, everything was good. And they said, well, you need to, why don't you preach one Sunday and let's just get, let you get some practice in because you haven't preached in a long time. And he got up there in front of what, 800, 900 people. I, 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 I hurt for him. I, I really thought at some point, I'm just gonna have to step up there and take over because this is horrible and he just did not have the ability so that's why I think Paul always emphasizes that teaching is a gifting of God mm -hmm. and so these elders that's the characteristics and that's a task that and we always need to keep that straight when we're when we're looking at elder stuff all right verse 10 gives a justification for this verse 10 starts off with what word for because all right you got to know this for there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from Judaism. And it literally, if you have a different translation now, it says of the circumcision. Okay? So, which is just sort of a euphemism for Judaism. Okay? Yeah. It, it's, it, it's just ek, ek, pistos, ek pistos, which is out of the one cutaway. That's all it is. So, all right. Verse 11, uh, it is necessary to silence them. <laughs> I like this. It's a Greek word, epistoma, which literally means to step on their tongue <laughs> or to step, to step on their mouths. <laughs> right. Glossa would be tongue. To step on their mouths or put your hand over their mouths if is a way of saying that. So it's necessary to do because you've done that with your kids. You've epistoma with your kids. All right, I got you. All right. Um, it's necessary to silence them. Why? Because they overthrow whole households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. Timothy, he wrote to Timothy last week saying, hey, be careful, watch out for these guys that are doing this for dishonest gain. Evidently, you could kind of go on the circuit and you could go and you could speak and you could say all these flowery things and if you had this gifting, you could stand up, you could talk and they would give you money because you were bringing the message of Christ, all right? And I guess if you were loud enough and used enough cliches, you could make a lot of money. Not, Not anymore, though. No. Oh, yes. Totally different now. TV changed so, all that. Yeah. Basically, I say, if you're on TV, I, I got some issues with you. <laughs> got a feeling you're going to head in the wrong direction on that. But anyway, so they, they're getting money. One of their very own prophets, this is where we get this line, it's Epimenides from the 6th, 7th century, wrote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And Paul says, this testimony is true. He goes, <laughs> he's spot on. So, therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in their faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of men who reject the truth. See, the truth, the false gospel, is always easier to believe than the true gospel. And people will always gravitate to the things that are false, that are not accurate because that sin nature is going to come out and it's going to drag them away. So when liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons hear easy theology or some cheapened 
grace. They're always going to run to it. All right? So he says, you got to be on your game because these guys are sorry. Verse 15, and this is where he kind of goes to the character here. To the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God. Uh, it literally means to confess, to, to speak the same. They like to speak the same words as God or to know God, but they deny him by their works. Uh, they are detestable, which is a really bad word in the Bible. You do not want to be detestable, all right? Because detestable implies God's going to test you and you're going to fail and he's going to spew you out of his mouth. It's always tied back to idolatry in the Old Testament. Um, homosexuality is connected to idolatry, which is this detestable thing in the eyes of God. Um, so you see this throughout, especially Jeremiah, Ezekiel's writings in the Leviticus. Do not be, this is detestable, this is detestable, this is detestable. And in the Greek, it's really fun to say because it's bedelugma. You don't want to be delugma, all right? Because you got to put a B and a D together, which is always fun to say. So, all right, so they are detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good work. Titus, the letter to Titus has the phrase good work in it six times. All right, he's, he's going for something. Paul's aiming at something. You see, good work is what you do on the other side of the cross. When your theology is right, you always find yourself doing good work. Uh, four times he uses the word kalos, kalos ergon, beautiful, excellent work. And only two of the times he uses the word agathos, which means good, good, good enough kind of works. All right. But he's always aiming at that, <clears throat> which is always different from other religions. Why? Because which side of salvation do they do their works on? We do our works after. We do our works because we are saved. All other religions do their good works. Why? In order to be saved. All right. See, this is the difference between Christianity. There was actually a conference back, I think it was the 1940s, 30s or 40s, of all these major religions came together. And they said, let's figure out what are the differences, what are the similarities, what is all this stuff. And um, um, C.S. Lewis was there in, in this conference. He was one of the Christian speakers. And he said, I know the one way that Christianity differs from all of you. You all do good works in order to get some form of salvation. We as Christians, we do good works because we have been saved. And they all agreed. Yes, that's true. That's exactly right. We all do it to get salvation. And your, th your doctrine, your theology has that flipped around, which we need to remember more often. So anyway. All right. Um, but the, the verse, uh, chapter 2. But you must say, uh, you must say these things, excuse me, but you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. That's a, he's going to, two times he's going to kind of really warn Titus, you've got to make sure you're spot on with your teaching. Why? Because these are Cretans. All right? They're evil, they're lazy, they're gluttonous, and you've also got opponents out there that are saying something that's real close. So you've got to be really strong in your teaching. You cannot have any wiggle room. You cannot have anything that they can knock on this. All right? Uh, he's going to list out some, some different people and sort of their roles. It sounds very similar to 1 Timothy in this. Older men are to be level-headed, uh, worthy of respect, sensible, sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. All right? I don't know what Paul's saying about the difference between men and women there, but he just says here, this is what you should be like and not be like, all right? They are to teach, meaning the older women, they are to teach what is good or beautiful or excellent. The older women are supposed to teach these beautiful tenets of God. Uh, this kalos, again, it's a word kalos. So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, verse 4, that word, so they may encourage. Does anybody have a different translation on that? Everybody have encourage? Um, I'm not sure exactly how the translator again. It, may, it fits. It makes sense. It's it's literally the word. So they may sophronizo, which means or to give wisdom, to speak wisdom into these younger women. All right, so that they speak wisdom to the younger women 
to love their husband and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure homemakers, kind and submissive to their husbands. All right, Paul's going to come around to this submissive thing. I had a thought that at any point in the Bible, does it tell husbands, husbands, you are to subjugate your wives? Is there ever that affirmative of, because we always get sort of the passive of, wives submit to your husbands. Do we ever get the husbands dominate your wives, subjugate your wives, make sure they are put in their place? No, but it's always wives submit to your husbands. All right? Um, so that, here's where Paul gives a reasoning. You ever wonder, why does Paul think women should be submissive? So that God's message will not be slandered. Wives, submit to your husbands so that God's message will not be slandered. Now, put those two things together. How does that work? Why would, why would a submissive or a non-submissive wife cause God's word to be slandered? Or God's message, logos, same word. What happens if you've got a religion that turns into a very female-dominated thing in a very male-dominated culture? What are the people in the city going to think of it, this church over here? All right, it, 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 it's going to be looked down upon. It's going to be seen as if, and again, we're talking about a first-century culture. First-century letter for a first-century culture. Okay, <clears throat> let's keep one six, two six. In the same way. Encourage, and this is the word parakaleo, the, to sit down next to and call out to somebody. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Same word as that wisdom, sophroniso. All right? Encourage young men to be self-controlled or wise in everything. Make yourself, Titus, all right? Implied statement. Make your, Titus, make yourself an example or a type of good, beautiful, kalos works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach. There's that second phrase where he says, you've got to be spot on, Titus. You've got to lock this in. You cannot go up there and just wing it, all right? And that's my biggest encouragement to young guys that are wanting to go into ministry, wanting to be pastors, to do not rely on your gifting. Do not rely on your gifting. You better study, 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 study. You better be spot on. You better be studied up, read up, know everything. Because we're speaking to an audience that needs that. So, I actually saw a Gallup poll today that said, um, what's the one thing people are looking for when they go to church? And 78% of the people replied, sermons that teach me the Bible. And 75% said one of the important things, or that, you know, they just said all these choices. One of the choices that a lot of people said was teaching that reflects the Bible. 75% said teaching that replies to my life. And worship team was only 38%. So, ha. <laughs> it's not about the music, right? Tell David. Tell David. All right. Now, it was an interesting study. It's a Gallup study. It's about a year old, but it was interesting. All right. Um, okay. So that, the, uh, so that the opponent will be ashamed having nothing bad to say about us. Again, that idea of slander comes into play here because he's going to be in a very contentious environment there in Crete. <clears throat> Nine, slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything, to which the opponents of the Bible say, see, the Bible advocates slavery. And what you've got to do when, when people come across you with that argument is you've got to say, okay, the Old Testament, the Bible was dictating how society was supposed to work. The New Testament was telling Christians how they are to live in a society, in a society that's being dictated to you. Everybody follow the difference there? The Old Testament is leaders of Israel. This is how you should administrate. The New Testament is you Christians who are hiding half the time. This is the world you live in. So live in it really, really well. See, the New Testament never dictates how you're supposed to live. How, how, excuse me, how you're supposed to govern. It always says how you're supposed to be governed. There, everybody understand the difference when we're there? So if anybody comes at you with that argument, say, whoa, 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 whoa. 
That's not, the, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works at all. Okay. Slaves are to be submissive to their masters in everything uh, and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness, not just faithfulness, utter faithfulness, so that they may adorn. It's the word cosmos. We get a word cosmetics from this. To adorn the teaching of God, our Savior, in everything. And I think that can apply to all of us. All right? How do we live our lives? Do, do we adorn the message of Christ? If people look at us, they go, wow, no, that look, that, you're making the message of Christ look really good. And sadly, so many, a lot of people make the message of Christ look really bad. They don't adorn the message of Christ. They take away from the beauty of it, which is a very dangerous place to be, if you ask me. Verse 11, I, I've, I've underlined it in, on your sheet. Um, I think this is such a beautiful, beautiful statement of what it means to be a Christian, um, what Christianity looks like, what it meant for the first century people. Uh, so I'm just going to read it straight through pretty much. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. Okay, now which gets really interesting when you look at the first verse and you say that to build up the faith of God's elect, which a lot of people like to go, well, that means these people over here. But he comes back in the same letter and he says, the grace of God has appeared with salvation for everybody. All right? So you, interesting, interesting trick there. Verse 12, instructing us, so the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. It's instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, that sophroniso, that wise, righteous and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, what's Paul's expectation of the second coming of Christ? When he says, while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It it's going to be, yeah, he, he's just, he's like, he was one of those any, kind, any day kind of a guys, okay? He was, he was looking forward to that, but he was waiting on the blessed hope, the appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody said to me, you know, if we have to go through the tribulation, how is it a blessed hope? I said, well, if I'm in the middle of the tribulation, how is it not a blessed hope when Jesus comes back? All right, I'm going to be like, amen, come on, anytime. That's even better to me. 14 says this, he gave himself. This is such a great depiction of what the gospel says. He gave himself for us to redeem. We've talked about this before. This is the word for ransom payment, lutroo, all right? To, to ransom us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. I think that's what the elect means. It's this people of his own possession. These are the people that, that he's cleansing. These are the people that are going to be cleansed. And that word cleanse is catharsis, literally to catharsis, all right? And these people, they are eager, zealous to do beautiful, beautiful works. So you should find yourself in that sentence. You should find yourself in there. The, the grace of God appeared for, with salvation, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust, to live sensible, righteous, in a godless way in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God, great glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he gave himself to redeem us or ransom us from all lawlessness, sin, and to cleanse for himself a people of his own possession, eager to do good works. That should be on your business card right there. All right? Uh, Fifteen, say these things. Encourage, rebuke with all authority, and let no one disregard you. Um, the Greek word there for disregard is peri for neo. It literally means peri, which is like a perimeter, all right? So on the outside, and phroneo means to think. Don't let anyone force your way of thinking out of the way. Don't let anyone be able to put you outside and go, well, that's just sort of the kook fringe guy. Fringe would be peri, all right? <clears throat> Verse, uh, chapter three. Remind them, we're gonna get sort of a, a miscellaneous of ethics here. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, agathos, just generic good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting. Sounds like Cody talking at the church under the bridge. Guys, can we just stop fighting, literally, physically punching each other? That would be awesome if we had a week with no fun getting punched. Um, 
to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. This word gentleness is a, a, the Greek word pros. Um, uh, Jesus uses it, he says, blessed are the meek, all right, for they will inherit the earth. The meek means pros, this is this control power. It's not powerlessness. Uh, sometimes we think of a meek person as sort of milk toast. Mm, he's boring. No, a, a pros person, a gentle person, is someone who is extremely powerful, yet they are under control. Uh, it was used for circus animals in the first century. All right, so the lion who didn't just eat the guy that's trying to train him, he was displaying pros or gentleness. His power was under control. It wasn't absent. It was just under control. That's what he's advocating here. <clears throat> Um, uh, verse 3. I love this. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. He mentions this in the Corinthian letter as well. Here's a list of all the really bad things, and we used to be like this. And I love it. This is the message of the gospel. We used to be like that but we're not that way anymore. That's not who I am anymore. Um, I just heard that California is considering a law that would outlaw sexual orientation rehabilitation or efforts. So literally, if I was in California and I, I could not sell a book, if they pass this law, I could not sell a book that encourages someone to change their sexual orientation that that would be against the law. And so it's just a matter of time before it comes into speech. All right? So, and, and that's why I love what Paul says. I used to be like this. I'm not this way anymore. And that's the beauty of the gospel. This is this cathartic thing, this deliverance and this cathartic thing. Because he says, for we too were once foolish and all these things. But, that's a good but right there, verse 4. But when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out this spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Again, it's sectioned off. It was probably some type of poetic verse, song, chorus, or something like that. And Paul brings this in. Now, why is he telling Titus this? Does Titus know, do you need, need to know the gospel? We all need to be encouraged and hear the gospel over and over and over again. So, but Paul just likes to share. And, and I, I like to say this. The reason we're so hesitant to share our faith and the gospel with unbelievers is because we're so hesitant to share the gospel with believers. We so rarely speak of the gospel to each other and talk about what God has done in our lives and the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of salvation with each other that when we speak to non-believers, it's like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. If we would say, discuss these things more with believers, we would be more apt to share it with unbelievers, in my opinion. So I think that's why he's kind of just encouraging Titus with this. This thing is trustworthy, verse 8. This thing is trustworthy. <clears throat> I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves, again, to what? Good works. All right, that's fifth time. Kalos, air gun. Uh, these are good. This is beautiful. This is callous and profitable for everyone. But let's be sure to avoid foolish debates. Genealogies? Who's really into genealogies? Jewish. Jewish people. Let's avoid these genealogies. Quarrels. Disputes about the law. Who does that? Which law? What law is he talking about? Moses. Yeah, the law of Moses. All right. For they are unprofitable and Reject a divisive person. Do you have a different, anybody have a different word on that? Divisive? It's the Greek word heretikon. Anybody hear a word in there? Heretikon. A heretic. It's a person who stirs up division. Yeah. A heretic is one who changes a doctrine. If I come out, like they accuse the Pope of saying, the Pope says there is no hell. Well, I'm, a, I'm altering a fundamental doctrine of the faith at that point. If I say Mary was not a virgin, I'm altering a fundamental aspect of the faith. Um, 
if I say the blood of Christ is not necessary for salvation, I am being a heretic by changing a fundamental or denying a fundamental doctrine of the faith. Uh, if I say Jesus is simply the descendant of God, the son of God, the literal son of God and not God himself, I would be accused of heresy or being a heretic. All right? So he says to them, he says to him, reject a heretical person, a divisive person, after a first and second warning. Why does he get two warnings? Because we want to make sure we're rejecting the right people and not just being a divisive person ourselves in this. All right? So watch him, you know, check him on these things, knowing that such a person is perverted and sins being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus, anybody remember Tychicus? What's his job? Always. He's the mailman. Tychicus is always the mailman. Uh, we, we're not sure who this Artemis is. He kind of jumps in the picture here. All right, maybe a guy Paul picked up in Rome or something. Uh, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me in Nicopolis. Again, this identifies where he is. He's not, he was in Macedonia. Now he's in Nicopolis. He's kind of making this rounds. Um, he'll be rearrested at some point in the near future. And he'll write Second Timothy from prison in Rome just before he's beheaded. So, for I've decided to spend the winter there, diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos. We pick up Apollos again. He's still in the mix. Apollos on their journey, so they will lack nothing. And our people must also learn to devote themselves to what? Good works. Kalos Ergon. Kalos Ergon. You should write that down somewhere. Good works. Beautiful works. Beautiful, extravagant works. Jesus says, do good works so that people will glorify your Father in heaven. That's what our goal should be. We should do such beautiful things that people go, dang, that being a Christian thing, really, that's awesome. That's, that's beautiful. God, we adorn the message with by doing so. All right? um, our people must learn to devote themselves to good works for cases of urgent need so that they will not be un fruitful. All those who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with all of you. All right? Short and sweet. All right? So if you ever need to read a book of the Bible sometime, just boom. Take you about 10 minutes, right? All right? But again, very similar to 1 Timothy. Very instructive. Uh, but I love the, the, for me, the, what I learned from Titus, this letter, is if I really am a Christian, if I really believe all the things that he's outlined here, how should I be living my life? With beautiful works everywhere I go. Just, you know, holding a door for somebody should be like, oh, that's just, that's almost too easy. I, not, not only have to hold the door for somebody, I got to go open their car door for them. I, you know, carry their groceries out there. Do, you know, it should be extravagant. All right. Again, I always like to come back to this example that Jesus used for, when he used this word. When, when he was anointed, all right, this days before he was crucified. And the disciples are going, ah, this was a waste of money. Why did we do this? And Jesus says, leave her alone. She's done something beautiful, excellent, kalos. And, and I love that he says, and every time the gospel is spoken, this will be mentioned. This beautiful work. But we don't do that, do we? We don't mention her when we share the gospel. We don't mention the fact that Salvation should create these beautiful works. And we should always talk about the gospel and go, you know, it's kind of like when Mary anointed Jesus in the days before his death, when she did something beautiful. That's what we should be doing. That's the effect it should have on our lives. It should be this extravagant thing that our lives, literally being put on the altar, the living sacrifice, to do beautiful, beautiful, excellent works everywhere we go so that we might adorn the message of Christ. And that's how Paul saw it. Uh, and that's what I love about Paul. I just love that about Paul. He saw it as just this process of doing these beautiful works and these excellent, praiseworthy things. And so he's wanted, he wants to encourage Titus to encourage that in the people there in Crete. All right. Any questions, thoughts, opinions? Yeah, he never married. Paul? Mm -hmm. Paul implies in, in 1 Corinthians 7 that he is a single person and we have no record of him marrying. He says, I wish more of you would be like me because you wouldn't be distracted. He says, because in marriage you will have tribulation. 
<laughs> Literally, he says that. In marriage, you will have tribulation. You will have blips. Uh, he says, but the unmarried person is not distracted by um, family, kids, all that stuff. So, I mean, imagine if he does have a wife. Does he go on missionary journeys? Does he have to check in all the time? Yeah. <laughs> True. True. All right. Any, any other questions, thoughts? All right. Next week is the last week. All right. So we'll look at 2 Timothy, and, um, and we'll celebrate. We'll have, a, we'll have a party to end it off. So, all right. So let's pray. Father, just, again, thank you for... Paul sitting down and writing his friend Timothy, or excuse me, Titus. Just uh, remind us of all the beautiful words that he wrote here. Remind us uh, of the fact that you gave yourself for us to redeem us, to ransom us away from the lawlessness and to cleanse us. Father, I pray that we would respond to that with beautiful, amazing works. That we would you would put these in front of us. And we were created for this purpose, to do these beautiful works. So, Father, give us the opportunity, but give us vision. Let us see those moments. Let us get excited, anticipate those moments. Or because we are a child of yours, we do beautiful things for your other children. And they glorify you and not us. That's our heart. Again, I thank you for our letters. Thank you for preserving them just over these, these millennia. And I pray that we would always treasure them as we should. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.